introduction. <clears throat> so I'm going to present Swoop, a software hardware co-design for non-speculative execute ahead in order course. So this work has been done in collaboration between Uppsala University, National University of Singapore, and Norwegian University of Science and Technology. So as you may know, in order course, they have limited performance, but they tend to be very energy efficient. On the other hand, we have out of order course, which use a lot more hardware resources to improve their performance, but in doing so, they also have not as good energy efficiency. So with Swoop, what we're trying to do is we take an in-order core, and then through a software hardware co-design, trying to improve the performance, reaching that of an out-order core, while maintaining the energy efficiency of the in-order core. OK. So let's look at an example. So we have a loop here that's summing up positive uh, numbers. And let's see how we would execute this one on a normal in-order core. So in the first iteration, we load a value, right? So uh, we see that by the square on the timeline. And then after that, we use this value to do the summation. OK, now in the second iteration, assume that this load misses in the cache hierarchy. So we need to go all the way to main memory to fetch the data. This takes 100 plus cycles in a normal machine. This is a quite long time. So we want to do execution now, right? We want to use this value, but the value is not available. So a conventional in order core will have to stall, waiting for the value. And for each iteration where we need to go to main memory, we will see the same stall. So the execution takes longer time. Now, in Swoop, what we're trying to do, so in the first iteration, will happen as normal, right? We will do the low, the value will be available, and we will immediately be able to do the execute. However, in the second iteration, when the load misses in the cache hierarchy, we have a way of informing the code that, OK, it's going to take some time before you have this value, so you should do something else. And what we do is we go ahead and execute more loads. And then by the time when we have executed these, hopefully the value of the first load has arrived so that we can continue doing the execution without having to stall. OK. So Swoop dynamically reorders the execution to hide load latencies. How can this be done? Well, Swoop targets loops. So here we have a loop with a loop body. What the compiler does is decouples this into an access and execute phase. So in the access phase, we put all the loads and all the instructions that needed to compute the, or execute these loads, so like address calculations and potentially control flow. And then in the execute, we sync all the uses of those loads and the compute of them. So this is nothing new, right? The coupled access execute had been done before. But what we do here is that we have introduced a new instruction, a check miss instruction, which basically says that, OK, if any of the loads that were in the access phase actually miss, so we need to go to the main memory, this information is uh, transferred to the application and then can act on this so we can do something else. Exactly how this check miss instruction works, I'm not going to go into those details. If you want to know more about that, please read the paper. So check miss, you can think of it as a branch with a branch condition that if any of the loads in the access phase missed, then we're branching out. So then we're branching out to what we call an alternative path. Right? And here we need to execute something else. And what we do is we execute a couple more access phases. So here we see access phase one and two as well. And once we have executed these, we go back and executing the execute phases. So since we jumped out of the loop, we do the first execute phase and then E plus one and E plus two. So if we're looking at like a timeline, so during normal execution, when we are in the loop, we would execute access zero, execute zero, access two, or sorry, A1, uh, E1, and then A2 and E2, right? So we would just be in the loop iterating as normal. However, on the alternative path, if we have the first uh, access phase and we have this load, right, then 
we would go and do access one, access two, and then go back to the E0. And then you see that hopefully we have covered its latency now so that the data will be available when we want to do the execute and thus not have to store the core. And then we would do the E1, E2, and then coming back to A3 when normal execution can continue. Okay, doing this type of software transformation raises a number of compiler challenges. challenges. So how can we create efficient decoupled access execute phases when we have things like memory dependencies, complex control flow, and register pressure, while being non-speculative and minimizing code duplication? So let's, have another, well, let's look at another example where we're trying to do decoupled access execute. So this is just a very simple random example of, of uh, instructions. So we do first a load, followed by a store, then another load, followed by a uh, store again. So normal decoupled access execute would move the loads ahead of the stores. In swoop, then we introduce the check miss, so we're getting the access phase A0, and execute E0. And then the check miss functions like a branch, right? So it's pointing to another place in the code where we would have two more access phases, so A1 and A2, followed by E0, E1, and E2. And once they have been executed, we would be jumping back to the loop again so we can continue normal execution. Now, if we have known data dependencies, so say for some reason we have a data dependency between the first store and the second load, well, then if we would try to do the same reordering for doing the access and execute phase, we would be wrong, right? We would have the correct functional uh, result. So instead we need to have a smaller access phase and we keep the load and execute phase. And then the unrolling in an alternative path, we would have a shorter access phase, right? A1 and A2 would be only two instructions. In the real case, we would probably unroll this to have more access phases, depending on how large the access phase is and the resources that are available in the hardware. And then we have the execute phases. Okay, nothing strange with that. Now, if we have an unknown data dependency, for some reason, the compiler can't tell if, if these alias are not. So there's a may alias. So we can still not reorder these because we can't assure that this is going to generate the correct result. So again, we put in the check miss after the first load and we keep the second load in the execute phase. But now when we do the alternative path, now we can prefetch or insert prefetch instructions that would prefetch the data for the second load because we don't know if the load depends on the store or if we're going to have to fetch it from, the, from main memory. So we prefetch for the second load and then we add the load for the second access phase and the prefetch for that and then for the A2 access phase, the load and the prefetch. And then the three different execute phases. And here now you can see that from the prefetch, the first prefetch, we're going to have this uh, latency or this uh, separation so that hopefully we're going to have the data available when the load is being executed. If this would be a dependency so that the store actually writes the value that the load would be using, well, we haven't lost much. We have executed three uh, instructions, three prefetches, but this is when the core normally would store, so the trade-off is still beneficial to do here. Okay, moving on to another topic. So increased register pressure. So when we unroll the access and execute uh, phases, we're going to have to use more registers, right? Normal loop unrolling. So uh, A0 using register 1, for example, A1 is using R2, and A2 is using R3. So we have an increased number of registers and increased live ranges. So how do we deal with this? Well, normally, a compiler spills registers, right, when we're running out of them. But we would do that, that would be a use of the loaded values, and that would stall our core. So register spilling is not something we want to do in this case. However, we have observed that communication is local to the access and execute, right? What is written in A1 is used in E1. It's not going to be used in E0. 
So we call this local communication a context, <coughs> sorry, and we propose a simple context registry main remapping that's done in hardware. So let's see how this can be done. So this is a hardware and software code designed to reduce the register pressure. So we have a few new hardware structures. So for each architecture register, an architecture register is the register that a compiler can use to assign values to. Right? So a MIPS have, for example, 32 registers usually. And for each of these registers, so here we have the architecture register R1, we have a so-called context vector. So in this case, we have three contexts. And then we have a register mapping, which maps from the architectural register to a physical register, so from R1 to P0. A physical register is all the registers that are available in the hardware that the hardware can use to allocate uh, to the architectural ones. Now, when we jump to a new access phase, what the compiler does at that point is introducing a new instruction, the CTX++, which updates the context. So this is software controllable. When do we go to a new ac access phase? And as long as we're only doing reads of this register, nothing happens. It continues as normal. But if we would write to this register, so there's a write to the R1 register, on the, that first write, the context register bit is set to 1, marking that we have a write to this one. And we get the new mapping. So we're mapping the physical register P1 to R1. And this is now our new register that we're using. And this happens automatically in hardware. The software doesn't need to deal with this. However, this is only done on the first write. So if you're writing multiple times to R1, it doesn't matter. We're still going to use P1 as the register for this uh, context. And then the same thing when we go to A2. The software updates the CTX uh, with the CTX++ instruction, and we get a new write to it. So we mark it with 1, and we map P2 to it. And the arrow here shows which is the active register, the one that's used while the execution of A2 is going on. Now, when we come back to E0, again, the compiler sets the context to 0. So we see that the CTX is now pointing to the first element in the vector. And the active register becomes the oldest uh, physical register in the register map. So P0 here. Now, when we go to the next execute phase, again, the compiler increases the context. And for all architectural registers with a context set to 1, so here R1, we see that there is a 1 here, right? The context vector bit is cleared, and the oldest physical register is unmapped. So as you see, P0 is now removed. P0 was used for E0, but for E1, we now get P1, and P1 is the active register. And the same thing for the next execute phase. So what you can see now is that if we're looking at the context A1, E1, in A1, the physical register P1 was used, and E1, the same register is used. So we're getting this local communication while we still have been able to use only one register from the compiler's point of view. We have used R1 through all these access phases. When we came back, or coming back to A3, the context is set to zero, uh, and we see that we have one register mapped to the, uh, or to the architecture register, and this is the one that's going to be used throughout the application until we again get the long latency uh, load. So to summarize this, a hardware or context register mapping is a hardware software solution to reduce register pressure. Only registers written in the access phase are remapped, and a register is remapped at most once per access phase, only if it's written, and only on the first write. And the contexts are software controlled. So this avoids increasing the register pressure, and it significantly reduces the remappings compared to an out-of-order core, because an out-of-order core constantly renames a register on every write throughout the whole application. Here we do a very limited amount of renaming and need a lot fewer registers because of that. So let's come to some results. So 
we have implemented the Swoop compiler based on LLVM. Since we propose new hardware, it doesn't exist a physical device that we can operate on. So we have used the Sniper multi-core simulator to simulate this design, and we use MacPat for energy estimates. The Swoop core is based on an in-order core similar to an ARM Cortex-7. So this is a uh, core that's used in the mid-range mobile phone today. And we have modeled one extra pipeline stage to account for this register context remapping. We compare this against an in-order core, which is similar to the Cortex-A7, but doesn't have the extra pipeline stage, of course. And also, an in-order core with a perfect L3 cache. This means that we never need to go to main memory. This is not a realistic design, but it, the latency that we're trying to hide with swoops, it's showing uh, what is the best we can do. We're also comparing it to an out-of-order core, similar to the Cortex-A15, which is uh, the core that's usually combined together with A7. So it's kind of the same uh, class of, of uh, CPUs. We're also going to compare it, compare it against Clairvoyance, which is a software-only solution that was presented at CDO 2017, which is basically do, trying to do what Swoop does, um, but without the hardware support. So we evaluate this using benchmarks from Spec CPU 2006, from Cigar, and from NAS benchmarks suites. And we use um, benchmarks that are high miss per kilo instructions. So let's look at some performance. So we have normalized speed up on the y-axis. So here, higher is better. And we have the different architectures that they're evaluating as the different bars. Now, Swoop improves the performance with 34% compared to the in-order core. We are 7% worse than the one that has a perfect uh, L3 cache, which is not possible to design. And we can see, even for two benchmarks, Swoop does better than this perfect L3. And that's because when we execute multiple access phases, we perform memory, uh, memory operations in parallel, which fetches data more efficiently. So we can even outperform this ideal, or ideal, this unrealistic architecture. In one case, we even outperform the out-of-order core. But in general, out-of-order has a lot more hardware and resources, uh, so we're not beating it on average. If we compare it with clairvoyance, so clairvoyance does very good on limited out-of-order cores, but on in-order cores, uh, you're more limited with the number of instructions and, and, or number of registers, and you can't introduce too much instructions because that causes overhead. And we see that with Swoop, we managed to improve the performance with 19% on the in-order core. Looking at energy, so here on the y-axis now, we have normalized energy, and of course, we want to consume less energy, so lower is better. So compared to an in-order core, we uh, consume 23% less. And if we look at the out-of-order core, which was the most performant core, it uses 57% more energy than the in-order core. So we see that Swoop finds a nice trade-off between improved performance and reduced energy. So, to conclude, Swoop is a non-speculative hardware software co-design where we introduce a new check miss instruction and a simple software controlled context register mapping together with a compiler that decouples loads from their uses and identifies independent instructions or code regions. And doing this, we're able to jump ahead in the code. So instead of executing the code sequentially, we can jump ahead to independent code and execute that earlier. And doing so, we improve the performance with 34% compared to an in-order core and reducing the energy with 23% against an in-order core. With that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so if I understood the, um, uh, the system correctly, you, 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 uh, you do your access phase, and then you get a cache uh, miss, and so then you launch lots of other access phases in other iterations. Um, 
I was wondering if it would make sense to have an, another signal that beyond that you've had the cache miss, but uh, another signal that says, ah, now the data has arrived um, from, from the cache um, and is ready, and now you can stop uh, doing all this speculative execution and just go back uh, to where you were. Um, would that make sense as, as an extension? That could make sense, yes. Of course, that would complicate things because you would need to have more signaling, right? And in most cases, you know that, okay, I need to cover roughly 100, 120 cycles. How many, how many issue ways do you have? So you know how much instructions you need to kind of execute to cover that latency. And if you just look at how large is the access space is, then how many do you need to execute to roughly cover that? So I think it's not really necessary to do that to still uh, be timely, so to speak. Thank you. Roshan from UD Austin. Interesting work. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right way to look at your work, but it seems like you're doing smart prefetching with software and uh, hardware help. So have you compared against other software or hardware prefetchers which uh, can improve performance? Um, or do you look at it in that way? Or? So uh, yes, we have looked at uh, other software solutions. Um, so for example, doing uh, software prefetching, um, I thought I had run ahead here also. Um, yes, there. So run ahead is when you uh, get to a store, you continue executing to hope that you will prefetch data, and then you roll back to where the store was and execute again. So we have been comparing against these, and Swoop is still outperforming the ones that we have been looking at, at least. So is, that, is it uh, because it avoids going too far ahead and prefetching too much ahead? or? So what is the... Yes, exactly. So for example, the run ahead executes the code, right? And then it rolls back. So that's uh, while we continue executing useful instructions, okay. for example. And software prefetching is difficult to do it timely, right? And it's also software prefetching takes up instructions. And in an in-order core, every instruction counts. Okay, cool. Thanks. So we do only the prefetching when we have the miss, right? When we know that we're stalling the core, so this is going to be, say, 100 cycles where we will do nothing. At that point, we use a little bit more instructions to actually gain performance. But if we don't have a stall, then we continue executing the more optimal version. Thank you. Hi, uh, very interesting work. Um, I was wondering, uh, from your running example there of the, the loop access, uh, the loop going through the, the loads, um, the loads there are all direct loads. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how to handle indirect loads or things like pointer chasing and uh, more complex address calculations. Yes, uh, the examples here were very, very simple. Um, <clears throat> what we are targeting actually, the loads that are more complicated, like indirect loads, um, that are not prefetchable. The examples here are like stride arrays, right? So the prefetcher would catch these. Um, if you have indirect loads and you might miss that more than one of these, what you can do is you can have multiple access phases. So we've been doing work on that also. So you basically put in more check misses, and then you do the first access phase, and then the second access phase, and so on, depending on how many indirections you have. I see. So you're kind of unrolling the, the, the access phase. Yeah, you're kind of splitting it up to more. So now we only had two access and execute. You would basically have multiple accesses. So you would go out mm -hmm. like multiple levels of it, yes. Okay. Got it. Thanks. So I'll, I'll ask a quick question. Mm -hmm. So what's happening in the cigar benchmark where you're outperforming out of order? Ah, and it has a, a good, very that, high that's a good question. energy. I don't, <laughs> this work is quite a while since we did, so. Or give me a plausible scenario where you would be outperforming out of order because I couldn't think of one. Yeah, I'm sorry. It doesn't come to mind why this is now. I would have to look up it in paper again. Okay, we'll put it. We'll just say it's an anomaly that needs investigation. Well, it is explained in the paper, so no question about okay, that. So it's just that then, I don't recall it right now. Then that's the answer. I will yes. read the paper. Yes. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, let's thank Magnus very much. <laughs>